Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joe Stevens, Assistant Dean of MBA Programs in the True Last College of Business. Thank you for joining us today for this seminar spe speaker series lecture and presentation. Before we begin, allow me to offer a couple of reminders. Please be um, sure to turn off your cell phones so they don't uh, interfere with any of the AV today. And please stay until the completion of the program, which also includes a Q&A with our speaker. Stories have a unique and power to persuade and mo motivate because they appeal to our emotions and the capacity for empathy. Marketers that have mastered the art of storytelling are able to more effectively connect to their target consumer and make the consumer feel good about the brands they choose to buy. Today's lecture will explore the concept of storytelling and will be accompanied by a number of brand examples that bring this idea to life. We are grateful to be able to welcome a successful Mizzou alum to present this lecture as part of the College's Speaker Series. Matt Ronkin is currently the Portfolio Director of the Golden Products Division of, the, of Nestle Pet Purina Pet Care Company in St. Louis, Missouri. He leads a team of marketers that build multiple brands across cat litter, litter box accessories, and yes, even dog litter. Isn't that funny? I, I find it funny. I used to work in this stuff, and I think it's funny. Um, prior to Ronkin's current assignment, he was director of marketing for Purina's global strategic business unit, where his responsibilities included the cross-fertilization of best practices and resource management across different global regions, and, and ensuring the successful launch of global product rollouts, along with the monitoring of competitive activity around the world. And before that, he spent 10 years in the pet food brand management organization for Nestle Purina North America, managing multiple brands, including Dog Chow and Friskies, both brands totaling approximately $1 billion in sales each. Prior to joining Nestle Purina in 1997, Matt started his career as an account executive for NCR AT&T, marketing and selling custom business forms and labels for industrial clients. He told us earlier today that he wasn't any good at that and, and uh, therefore decided to go uh, down a, a new route. Which brings me to the next part of his uh, career. He moved into a business analyst position for Information Resources Incorporation, otherwise known as IRI, a company that contracts with consumer packaged goods companies to track retailer sales, share, and pricing data, and eventually work for the on-site team handling pu the Purina account. After four years in that position, he then joined Purina to work in their marketing group and has been there ever since. Mr. Ronkin grew up in the St. Louis area. He attended the University of Missouri and graduated with a bachelor's degree in marketing in 1992, and then he obtained an MBA from St. Louis University in 1997. He's been a member of the Crosby MBA Advisory Board since 2009 and held the chairman role for the board in 2011. We're excited that Matt has made time for us out of that busy schedule that he maintains to join us today. Please join me in welcoming Matt Ronkin. Thank you. Uh, can you guys hear me? Okay, so we're working. So now we're down to about 50 minutes, right, Joe? <laughs> so it's, uh, that's an impressive list. I didn't know I'd done all that. So um, I have about an hour, so a couple of things. We were working through some technical glitches this morning, so if I have to go back and forth between the presentation and some videos, uh, I'll do that, so please bear with us. But, what I've learned, too, is that more videos, less me talking actually gets a, gets a little bit better response. So I'll, uh, I'll fill it up with some examples rather than just sort of uh, theoretical about, uh, about storytelling. So as Joe mentioned, um, I do come from the marketing side. I work for Purina. I've uh, been in their brand ma management group for about 15 years. Uh, and so have managed or been, been a part of uh, brand teams from Purina um, throughout that time across the portfolio. And I think the thing that, that I see consistently in terms of our brands, and then we'll propose that other brands that are successful is marketers have a way to connect those brands to the consumer. And really the backbone of how they do that is through storytelling. So we're not really marketers per se, we're storytellers. Uh, and uh, so we'll kind of explore that as we go. Um, just a little bit in terms of, of uh, my, uh, my Mizzou connection. I just turned around as if I'm in anybody's way <laughs> on, uh, on the screen. 
that's, uh, that probably won't be the case. Um, so I graduated here in 1992, so 20 years ago, uh, with a BSBA uh, uh, with a marketing emphasis. Um, I think back, and I look at this group, and I look at this new building. So we were over in, uh, in a Middlebush Hall, uh, so the auditorium was a little bit different than this one, that's for sure. Um, we didn't have any computers that we brought to class, so I've seen a number of folks with theirs. I'm extremely, extremely jealous. Um, we had no internet, so think about that for a second in terms of uh, how we had to put term papers and things like that together. We didn't have, uh, we didn't have Wikipedia, right? That's the, that's the uh, and then, uh, then I just thought about, you know, what if I had a picture of myself back then and I thought better of it, um, but I thought I'd show you guys a, a picture of my, my car at the time, quite a chick magnet. Uh, but I, I called it the brown bullet. I won't tell you what my friends called it, but uh, if, if they needed a ride, they, they, certainly, uh, they certainly took the ride. Um, Joe just went through all of this, um, so I won't go through it anymore, but the, the gist of it is I have been in brand management for Purina for the last 15, 15 years. Um, a little bit in terms of the, the history of Nestle Purina, or, or really the snapshot of, of who we are. So the Nestle got added to Purina about 10 years ago, 2002, and so we're part of the Nestle uh, family of companies. Um, we're about $15 billion in, in global sales, about half of that within the U.S., uh, and then we still are headquartered in, uh, in St. Louis, uh, Missouri. So I, I assume that many of you know kind of that whole phrase of brand managers. Obviously, most of you that are marketing majors, I hope you have come across sort of that, that concept. But what do brand managers do? And so really, um, we're the stewards of the brand for the rest of the organization. So with Purina, we have over 50 brands of pet food, litter, yes, dog litter, um, and so each one of those brands either has a team of folks or a person in particular that is the steward of that brand uh, for the organization. So we work on brand positioning, uh, consumer communications, which is advertising, packaging, promotions, uh, product development, pricing strategy, consumer research execution, and ultimately, how do we make those brands uh, successful? So just a couple of slides in terms of the importance of building strong brands. And so there's a little bit of, duh, why wouldn't you want your brand to be strong? But two things. One, strong brands create loyalty. And then loyalty equals growth and profit. So brands are something you have to water, you have to nurture, you have to keep them relevant, you have to connect them to the consumer. Because any category that you're working in, there's guys like you that are also thinking about how do they get that same target consumer. So it's important that we continue to grow those strong brands uh, to build that loyalty. And then secondly, um, you see it now. And so 2008 is the, the recession hit and has continued to linger. Uh, and people have changed their buying habits. We see that. So there have been a lot of shifts in different categories. And people aren't always going to the lowest price brands. They're going to the brands that they trust, the brands that mean something to them, that, that, that make them feel a certain way. And so that's how you know the true strength of a brand if it's actually growing Within, uh, within the recession that we, that we have today. There's three ways for your brand to really compete. Um, the first is lowest price, and so obviously very not, very not sustainable. Um, there's always gonna be somebody that will be able to come into a category and give you uh, a product at a cheaper price, especially now that we're in a global uh, economy. The second way is through superior technology or even patented technology that others can't get access to. And so there are some industries where that's a big deal, um, but within the industry that I work in, consumer packaged goods and, and most others, clothing and the like, it's usually not a technology play. Um, ultimately, it comes down to those brands that can create emotional connection uh, with their consumers. And the way to do that is through their heart. And so, as I talk about this, and it sounds very theoretical, and yeah, 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 I want to connect to, the, to your heart and all of that. No, I don't really think about brands that way. Um, I think some of the examples that I have for you today, I hope spark something in you. And so when I do show some of these examples, um, I don't want you guys just to look at it as, wow, that was cool, love that song, that was a cool image. What I want you guys to do is, is think about it two ways. One, from the marketer's perspective, what are they trying to communicate? What's the story that they're trying to get a consumer to buy into? And then secondly, put yourself in the consumer's shoes. Why is that a brand that would appeal to me? Or who is that consumer that that would appeal to? And so I've chosen brands that I think people will be familiar with 
and yet I want you to look through it uh, a little bit different lens going forward. So really this idea of connecting through the heart is the product, yes, it has to be good enough to be able to fulfill the needs that you, that you have. So you buy paper towels, it better be absorbent, it better do the job, uh, all of those kind of things. But the brand itself has to stand for something that ultimately connects to the consumer's heart. So as I started this off, the way to do that is through, uh, through the art of storytelling. And so I'll, I'll show you how that applies to, uh, to the marketing industry. So why are stories important? So if you think about them more from an anthropological standpoint and why we resonate, why stories resonate with us, there's a couple ways. One, stories are sticky. We remember them. So if, uh, if your girlfriend calls you, um, she went out last night and then wants to tell you about, about that, she could give you a laundry list. I left the house at 7. I stopped at this restaurant. I was with these people. Um, we did this and this. Fine, you'd get the information, but you're not pulled into that experience. You're not going to ask her questions. What happened next? Who were you with? What happened? All of those kind of things. So it's really about how people put all the facts together in an engaging way for the consumer. So we're going to do a little bit of a, an exercise. So here's a list of, uh, of 16 things. Hopefully they don't seem like they're uh, highly correlated to one another. If they are, then, uh, then you do have some good stories. Um, but look at this list for another 10 seconds or so. So if you have paper or just mentally, um, there were 16 things on that list. Um, so how many can you remember? Does anybody feel like, even if you're not going to do it on paper, does anybody feel like they could, they could name all 16 right now? I'm giving away an iPad. No. <laughs> Joe's giving away an iPad. <laughs> no? Not in the budget? So I'll put that list back up there. And the reality is very few people with that amount of time can remember more than eight, maybe 10. But probably the average is somewhere around four, five, six, something like that. But if that same information was positioned in a story, so as the cop walked up to Mary Lee's 72 Dodge, actually that wasn't my car that I showed at the beginning of the presentation, he saw three green melons, a dwarf, an open wine bottle sitting in the front seat. He was not amused. So if I took that away, you'd be able to, to, be able to play that back. I mean, you're a, you put yourself in that, that story. Maybe you're Mary Lee, maybe you're the cop, maybe you're just a, an advisor, but you wanna know what's gonna happen next and why were those things in the car? And, uh, and where did she just come from? And so it's just a way of, of putting all the information together in a way that we absorb, because we're empathizing with, uh, with what's going on. Stories are powerful. So I talk about sticky, now I'm gonna talk about powerful. So they have a unique ability to persuade, to motivate, they appeal to our emotions, and then this capacity for empathy. We wanna relate, and that's why a certain movie will take off and be $600 million dollars Million, billion, million dollars worldwide, uh, and we can all relate to it in, in some way. So I'll give you another example. So if I just showed it to you this way, um, it's geometric shapes, it's some colors, um, there's not much of a story here. Um, but if I put it in motion, impressive, right? I'll do it again. One more time. <laughs> it gets better. OK. Is, I know it's a big room, but does anybody want to volunteer just even part of what the story might be? And there's no right answer. I mean, there's, there's not a, a correct answer. But is anybody seeing a story? Or did anybody come, anything come to mind? You almost raised your hand, so you're going to get picked on. Okay, you can submit it in writing and I'll, I'll, I'll grade it. I feel like it lacks an emotional uh, perspective that gives the, the fake character. Like, mm. it's, it's just like, more of a generic at this point. But you're starting to see that actually something, something could be there. Anybody else? Uh-huh.
That's awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> Do they have names? Uh, <laughs> you didn't get that far? <clears throat> so thanks for, thanks for speaking up. That's exactly right. I mean, universally, the stories that could start to get assigned to this, the little triangles in love with the circles. So that's the little triangle kind of outside the circles, circles in the middle. The big bad gray triangle is guarding the door, trying to steal away the circle if she ever presents herself uh, the opportunity. The blue triangle fighting back, yelling to his love to escape into the house and following her inside where they embraced and live happily ever after. Yeah? You guys feeling it? I'll play it one more time. I love you. I love you. All right. So the two of you guys got that separately. You started to go that there's a narrative. Yes, there's some emotion that needs to be involved, but we assign emotion to it. Even the simplest things, when you take it from a static to something that could have meaning, we already, we put empathy uh, against it. We love stories. We relate to stories. So there's a reason why there are certain stories that are just classics. So basically anything Disney becomes an automatic hit. And that's not on accident. I mean, Disney does so much work. And if you really look at it and analyze the Disney stories, most of them are exactly the same, right? Or at least there's three or four sort of themes that you see there, and yet we go and we buy every one uh, uh, that comes out. The Wizard of Oz is a classic tale of somebody that leaves home and then comes back and appreciates it again for the first time, and that's a theme that, that comes throughout with classic archetype characters um, that you can relate to. Everybody relates to, to one of those characters. Um, Twilight, I mean, why is this thing such an amazing hit that it's been? Or Harry Potter, and why are these things universally they appeal to. We like the characters, we like the plot, we like the narrative. Um, it appeals to our emotions, and then I'm, again, I'm dating myself, but, uh, but the whole idea of Star Wars. Um, I just want to put this on because it was a cool graphic. You guys watching? Okay. All right, so stories in general are something that we, that we relate to, and so what is a brand story? What does that have to do with branding? So, a brand story is a narrative told from the brand's point of view. So it personifies the brand, it gives it meaning, it gives it a personality, something for you to latch onto, and helps make it personally relevant to the consumer. And so I, I love this quote, our strongest relationships are, those, are with those brands whose stories resonate most deeply within us. We want to buy into these stories to be a part of them, not least of which is because they help us tell our own story. So, what I'd propose is the brands that we become most loyal to define who we are or become a part of us. We feel a certain way by associating ourselves with those brands. And some of those brands are truly badge brands, what we call badge brands that are on the outside, that others see us with those brands and assign a certain meaning to us. Other ones of those brands are more internal. They're not as visible to the outside. Pet food is one of those. Typically, most people don't sit there and talk about which pet food brand they are. But some of the examples that I'll show you, cars and clothes and all of those kind of things, are very visible to the outside. And they define who we are. And it's because we've bought into their story. So every great brand has a compelling story of, of one kind or another. So over the next 30 minutes or so, what I'll do is, is I'll show you um, some different brands and their stories. And hopefully through the videos that I'll show and the music and, and the energy, um, Again, look at them through two ways. One, from a marketer's perspective, what are they trying to communicate? How are they different than any other choice that the consumer has in the marketplace? And then from a target consumer standpoint, who would buy into this? I mean, who is this a brand for? And if you put yourself in those shoes, what is that person getting out of, of, uh, of buying that brand? Okay, so the first one uh, is, is Mini. Has anybody seen the Win Small? Um, I'll call it a spot, but it's really a YouTube, other than Joe. <laughs> um, so everybody's familiar with the brand Mini, right? 
So it's a fairly old brand, and yet it's been kind of given, given a resurgence. Um, so it's the Mini Cooper is, is what it is, owned by BMW. Um, but the, think about the car category and how hard it is to create space and create differentiation within the car category if you're coming in from scratch. And so I'll show you how uh, many attempts to do this. We sit calm now, we sit down. Where the monkeys, where the show, but if you come along, yeah, you'll be alright. Some say that we're back in school. I'm back in school, we'll break the rules. Yeah, we'll break the rules, but you'll be alright. We salute you. Go, go, go. So does anybody own a Mini in here? Anybody drive one? Nope. Okay, then we can talk about it. <laughs> nope, actually that's a good. So what is Mini's story? I mean, what are they trying to get you to buy into? Where's my back row friends up there that had all the narratives? Yep. Anybody else? So some things in there that are making more powerful than they than they were. Uh huh. The spot also gives Mini some personality that larger cars lack. So it's implying that even though you might be smaller on the road, you're still going to be seen. Yes. So it's kind of like the Mini Cooper. Yeah. 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 You're going to be asked about it. So this is a badge brand. I mean, people know somebody that, that drives the Mini, and it's not like a car that can just sort of, sort of weave its way into sort of the background. I mean, it, it will be noticed. Eric? Why do you think they didn't show the actual updated version of the car at the very end where it was all this historical black and mm -hmm. gray sort of? Yeah, it, it's a good question. So Mini's been around for a long time, and it was a racing brand before anything else. So I think that's part of it, too, is, as you talked about. It's small but, but powerful, and so uh, I bet they did some work to sort of go, okay, pulling on the heritage is really... Um, now, there will be other communications that, that show the, the modernity and, and the, the contemporariness of the Mini, and that's certainly been what's behind the resurgence, um, but I think it's part of the classic small is fearless, David and Goliath, or, or uh, you know, the ants carrying the leaves and, and the like. Okay, another... A uh, very powerful brand that elicits a lot of emotions is Harley Davidson. So, Mini's about the underdog. Um, there's nothing underdog about Harley Davidson. <laughs> nothing. In fact, it's the complete opposite of people that drive Harleys want to be known. Does anybody drive a Harley? Want to be known as <laughs> big and bad and, uh, and want you to buy into that, that it's about uh, the rebel inside all of us. And so, let me show you. Uh, what the Harley story is all about, although I'm sure you guys could nail this one without this.
So what's the Harley story? Anyone? Freedom. Freedom. Love it. Um, I thought it was interesting that they had a belt hole at the very beginning, and then they showed people working in the office place, which usually implies that like, they're running out of time. And so then the music is like, uh, tell us how to live or whatever. So um, it's kind of showing that it's almost too late and they need to do what they want to do and become big macho men and ride motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> Yep, I think, that's, I think that's good, both those. So I think this, this next quote goes exactly to that. So even Harley Davidson knows what they have. So what we sell is the ability for a 43-year-old accountant to dress in black leather, ride through small towns, and have people be afraid of him, right? <laughs> I can relate to that. Um, but it's true. I mean, these bikes, some of these bikes cost $100,000. I mean, there's, there's no way the parts themselves, and yes, there's a lot of customization to them, but you're buying into a lifestyle. And so, yes, it was built on the traditional biker, but it's, but it's people that, yeah, feel like they're giving themselves to work from nine to five, but as soon as that bell rings, they need to get start living. And so, some of these images are all about freedom, customization, lifestyle. Um, and it's very clear what that lifestyle is. And then I, I, I love this image that I found where, you know, as a marketer, what I lo would love is for people to pay money to put my brand on their clothes. This takes it to a whole different level, <laughs> right? So this is their print ad, World Tattoo Rankings, you know, Harley Davidson 1, Mom 2. Um, but it just goes to show how embedded that the Harley Davidson culture is for those that buy into it. So two good examples, kind of on the other end of the spectrum from uh, within the, the vehicle stage. Okay, I'll switch gears. So are people familiar with the brand method? Kind of raise hands, no? Okay, so some of you. It's a fairly new brand. Um, it's an independent company uh, for now. Has been gobbled up yet by a, by a larger company. Um, that started about 15 years ago and really has gotten legs over the last eight or 10, but it's still a fairly small brand. I mean, in the whole scheme of things, it's about a $150 million brand, so not large at all. Um, but these guys, two things. I think they realized that the entire cleaning category, the stories were all the same, and so there was no differentiation in the stories to buy into. And really, when you look at the cleaning category, Scrubbing Bubbles and Mr. Clean and the Brawny Man, it's all the same story, it's all the same message, it's about power and it's about getting the job done um, at whatever, whatever it takes. And so Method thought about the world differently and came at the cleaning category that way. Saying is there ain't no better reason to rid yourself of vanities and just go with the seasons. It's what we aim to do. Our name is our virtue, but I'm yours. Well, open up your mind and see like me. So, 
that feels very different than Mr. Clean or, or uh, just about any other cleaning product out there. And so Method has hand soaps as well as cleaning supplies that you, that you use for the house. And it really was birthed from a vision that they had. I mean, this wasn't a marketing exercise for them. I mean, it was birthed that these guys believed in this, that the power of nature and that there could be a greener way uh, to clean. Um, the idea of design for this category. So especially for hand soap, it's a very visible thing in one's house, and yet for everything to come in the same soft soap dispenser, um, so you get a very different feel from a design perspective. And then this idea of just being very playful and light, again, very different than what's out in the category. So these guys really believe in this mission. They've got, a, they've got an email that you can sign up for, People Against Dirt, um, that's both from an from a ecosystem standpoint as well as just all of their new items. And so a very cool brand that's been birthed that eventually will get bought um, by, by somebody bigger, I'm sure. Um, the next example I have is from cereal, so um, from Cheerios. And so if anybody, I won't make you raise your hands, but if anybody watches Saturday morning cartoons, um, or at least has a niece or a nephew that you may have watched Saturday morning cartoons with, I mean, the stories that these, these brands, it, it's unbelievable, I mean, just the, the sensory experience, it's almost too much. I mean, the, the commercials are better, actually, than the, than the cartoons, at least in, in my estimation. Um, and most of the, the cereal category aims directly at the kids. It's a bit of a, 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 push, a push strategy, if you will, to have the kids, or I guess pull strategy, to have the kids then ask mom for a certain way. And so Cere Cheerios plays in that space to appeal to the kids, but they also realize that they had to do it from a from a push standpoint and get mom bought into this as well. And so what's interesting about their stories is they have multiple stories depending on who their audience is. And so I'll show you two commercials in a row and then you guys can tell me which one is aimed at the kids and which one's aimed at the moms. Everybody move in! It's Peace Little Brother! Just can't quite swing it sometimes. Better luck next time, little guy. Why not power up with a good breakfast? Like one with Cheerios. Big old power and practice can help make you feel good enough to play in the big leagues. Cheerios, big old power. It's out of here. The point of that alien, I'm still not sure, but again, this is aimed at five and six and seven year olds. And here's the next one. We waited so long for this. I can't believe it's finally happening. at the kids and which one at the parents. <laughs> Guess that wasn't uh, difficult, but yeah, for those of us that are, that are parents, that one, uh, that one was really well done. Um, but you see it, very different stories. One was about push versus pull, one being asked for, the other one, and you know, eat Cheerios and you can be playing with the, with the big kids, and then the other one just as the connector, as, uh, as the caregiver. Um, Okay, the next example I have is within the water category. So there's a brand, uh, it's actually a Nestle brand called San Pellegrino. Um, it's a sparkling water made in, in uh, Italy. Yes? <laughs> um, and so think about water in general. I mean, the whole idea of bottled water in general, I mean, if an alien came to the planet today and saw how much we were spending on bottled water when tap is available, it's, it's pretty ridiculous, let alone that you can create a brand within water. Um, so water, by definition, is a commodity category. And so um, San Pellegrino wanting to be a premium water, it's a sparkling water, um, then needs to take their story to the next level and get to, you to buy into something more than just this is going to quench your thirst. 
cut it off there. I think you guys get the, get the idea. But it's the whole idea of water, and this, this has become actually a, a, a badge in, in some people's households. So I have friends that buy this by the case, serve it when they have dinner guests. Um, but the whole idea of wherever you live, live in Italian. And so the true test of, of a brand story really comes down to, can you charge that premium price? Can you be successful in the marketplace? And so you can start at the bottom and go tap waters free, um, still or flat bottled waters, 30 cents a piece. I mean, carbonated is a little bit more as it is. You buy this at home, it's $2 and some change. I mean, you can pay upwards of $10 in a restaurant um, when they ask you, would you like tap or would you like, would you like uh, sparkling? And so it's, uh, it's truly the test that that brand story uh, is sinking into people. All right, so getting back into the wheelhouse and sort of, as I talked about, I work for Purina. I've worked on a number of the brands uh, at, at Purina at some point. And so, as I've shown you other brands and why it's important to build this story, um, it's really important in pet food, and I'll give you two reasons. The first one is this. So, you just buy, bought a dog or bought a cat, you're a first-time uh, pet owner. This is what you encounter when you walk down, down the aisle. I mean, how the heck are you going to choose which brand is right for you. I mean, you can sit there and read all the packages, and quite honestly, they all say about the same stuff. I mean, they're all based, mostly based on the same ingredients, some a little more premium than others, but your ability to choose when you're in aisle um, is very difficult. So if we're not influencing the consumer uh, to be thinking about a specific brand as they go into, uh, to go into the store, we're gonna be in trouble. Um, and then the second one is this. This is what we're selling. the glamorous, sexy world of wet dog food, or canned cat food. Um, and yet, it's an amazing category to be a marketer in. So if I had to, to sell this, it's very hard to differentiate this relative to our, to our competition. And at, 
I'm going to say this is probably somebody else's because ours looks a little better, better than this, but I, <laughs> if my boss is listening, then it's, ours definitely looks a little bit better than this. Um, but you get the idea. So between a crowded shelf and so many choices that a consumer has, and then this idea of if this is what's in the product, and this is not just, just to our category. I mean, think about paper towels or think about laundry detergent. I mean, honestly, it's all the same stuff. So the powerful brands are finding ways really to empathize with the owner, and it's the owner that buys the food. Yes, they're kind of translating that into what relationship they want with their pet, but ultimately, it's, uh, it's the owner's emotions that we need to go to. And we spend millions of dollars sort of teasing apart the marketplace to understand how one set of owners is different than the other. We, talk, we call it a segmentation analysis. And there's, really, there's a reason why we have 50 brands of pet food that make up, again, $15 billion, um, is that it's our ability to tease apart brands. So I'll just give you a, a few examples and just want to leave a little bit of time um, if there are any questions. Um, but I'll show you two in dog and then two in cat. So on the dog side, um, Purina Beneful, which was launched about 10, 10 years ago and is now uh, almost a billion dollar brand. Um, so it's a new brand. So it has the ability to sort of create its story from scratch. Uh, it has the luxury of not having any kind of heritage or tradition um, or baggage to pull from. And so it could define its story any way it's wanted. And really the whole platform here for Beneful was the idea of two peas in a pod, that you and your dog are, are linked and against the world and you can do it in a playful, joyful way. What you do? And he's saying, I'm ready. So if we can get people to buy into to that instead of you know, truly have to, to think about the ingredients and all of that kind of stuff, and again, it's that idea of two peas in a pot and that it's you and your dog against the world and, and do it through play, um, that life is better together. Then I'll, then I'll contrast that to dog chow. So dog chow has been around for 70 years. Um, it was the original Purina dog food, and so there's baggage to that, which is it's old-fashioned, um, it's what my parents and my grandparents fed, so there's got to be better uh, options out there going forward. Um, but what the brand has chosen to do is to embrace that heritage, and that yes, it is the dog and the dog food that, that, uh, that your parents fed and your grandparents fed, and it was good for them, and it can be good for you, that it's still um, what your dog needs. They also tap into that whole idea of the family dog, and so the dog itself kind of completes the family, if you will, that we wouldn't be a family without it. So on the Beneful side, it was kind of two peas in the pod and you and your dog against the world. This is much more about a family brand pulling on its heritage.
So again, that dog chow story is about your imperfect dog brings your imperfect family closer together. So you can see two billion dollar brands that are aimed just a little bit differently, both attitudinal segment wise as well as demographic wise. And you can see how that can be a powerful message that, that consumers buy into. So that's on the dog side. Um, two examples on the cat side. So I've, I've worked on the cat brands as well. I can tell you there's a difference between a dog owner and a cat owner. Anybody own cats in here? OK, I'll be nice. <laughs> no, and I, I say that lovingly, that it's, they're just very different. The relationship that a cat owner has with their cat is very different than that on the dog side. So from a marketing perspective, you have to respect that. So we have a whole different attitudinal segmentation uh, model on the cat food side than, uh, than on the dog food side. And we love, we love them equally. So two brands, um, Fancy Feast. Um, these happen to be billion dollar brands as well. Fancy Feast. Um, and Friskies. So both are uh, big canned cat food um, brands, yet Fancy Feast is a super premium. So we put it in a can that's half the size and we charge twice as much. So the challenge there is then what is the story that you're getting consumers to buy into that ultimately lead to loyalty to Fancy Feast? And our loyals are very loyal. I mean, they're spending um, significant money every year. In fact, they're feeding two cans a day every day, sometimes three cans a day. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a way to tap into that. The insight here is that these consumers, for, for them, food is love. The best ingredient is love. And so we've turned Fancy Feast actually into a love story. But like I said, it's about a love story, and that the best ingredient is love, and so Fancy Feast is about ways to find different, different ways to say, um, I love you, between the cat and, uh, and its owner, and along with a nice love story sort of weaved all the way through it. And then the other brand um, that also is in canned cat foods, so the product is very similar, um, is Friskies. They also have other forms. Um, but where Fancy Feast is a love story and very quiet and about that, that quiet emotional territory, Friskies is very loud. Um, and you see that, let's go put these slides in there. You see it in the packaging, you see it in the varieties that it adds, and it's all about fun and living vicariously through, through your cat. So I'll show you a couple of videos here. What if one little pop could open Has anybody seen that spot on, uh, on TV? Yeah. So, yeah, that's what happens if your cat gets into a bag of mushrooms, I think. <laughs> uh, so it was a lot of fun kind of coming up with the insights behind that. And really, the insights are twofold. That one, um, there's, a, there's a classic story called the hero's journey and the trials and tribulations that they go through as they, as they discover the world, but really themselves. And so we've turned the cat into that explorer uh, archetype. And then secondly, this insight of owners really want this inside peek at, at what the cat sees, what's the world that they live in. And so we gave it to them <laughs> in, uh, in spades. But when you ask owners, I mean, these, these words in the pink are really what they feel like their cat is up to and doing. And, and the insight, again, is 
people live in this world, we have rules and boundaries, and cats can live in this world that's just endless with possibilities. And so um, if we can give them a, a feel and a taste and to buy into that brand story, then, uh, then Friskies is a brand for them. So again, you see the, the extreme differences between Fancy Feasts and Friskies, and yet what's in the, it's in the can is, is very, very similar. So um, just to summarize, I've shown you a lot of examples and sort of set up this idea of storytelling. One, stories add emotion and meaning uh, to the brand message. And so hopefully you've felt that a little bit through some of these, these videos. They allow us to engage the consumer and then connecting through empathy. And so it's our desire to be able to connect these things and insert ourselves within these stories. It's a powerful tool to help the brand break through, uh, which is important in a very competitive world, um, building both equity as well as loyalty. And then honestly, um, from a marketing standpoint and those that, are, that will be future marketers, um, they make it fun. So if you can figure out the brand story that's resonating with somebody, then you're rolling downhill from there. I mean, packaging and advertising and product development and, and all of the different ways that we have now that we didn't have 10 years ago to bring brands to life, especially within the digital space. So um, I wanted to, to wish all of you that are uh, on your career journeys or starting it to, uh, to have good luck and then uh, just any questions or, or discussion. Thanks, Matt. We have about five minutes for questions, and so if Duncan and Jordan can kind of watch for the hands. Um, Curtis, I saw your hand go up first, and if you can wait until we get the mic to you, that'd be great. Thanks, Curtis. Uh, thank you very much for your commercial examples, but Golden Products includes a lot of other you know, products like, for instance, kitty litter. Yep. So how do you build narratives around things like Kitty litter. <laughs> so it, it's the same as, as that picture of the, the canned cat food or canned dog food that was at the beginning as well. I mean, it's, it's less about product. I mean, the product has to perform, but it's really about the emotions and, and the insight that we need to tap into. So for people with cats, you know that the, 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 the exact time that you're expecting your dinner guests to come, your cat's going to lay a steamer. You just know it, right? And so if you, if you can then give them the security um, that they need, um, because the emotions that people talk about when their litter's not working is shame, fall from grace. I mean, you get, you get real doozies. So if you can market them on a promise that you'll be there for them in those, those toughest moments, then that's what you're asking people to buy into. Down here, Roxanne. And then, and then Frank, and then... We'll I'll watch for somebody over here. Um, I'm curious, from a marketing perspective, um, do you feel that the, the annual Incredible Dog Challenge is kind of a rewarding experience for loyal brand members, or does it help build and increase the brand through its national um, broadcast? So it's, it's twofold. I mean, the, the, the folks that go to these typically are pretty Purina loyal. Um, so it is. In fact, the, the Incredible Dog Challenge finals are at Gray Summit, Missouri on Saturday, if anybody wants to go. Um, and then the exposure that we get on some of the networks, we've had um, partnerships with ESPN and then USA Networks and things like that. I think what it allows us to do is just contemporize Purina, be seen in a different way than, than some folks. And so from a competitive standpoint, it's a way for us to be able to influence those that don't currently buy Purina. Uh, Frank. I saw that those are great videos, uh, very interesting stories. But uh, I mean, uh, I saw your previous background was in R R IRI, so mm -hmm. it was kind of, I assume it's a more quantitative role. Mm -hmm. So how does the, uh, the number side of uh, the brand building, uh, how, how did you deal with that one, that part, number I mean, side? How do I personally utilize yeah, sort of numbers, that uh, as a foundation? Because I, I feel like just uh, more about creativity, but I, yeah. I guess that would be the number yeah. behind that. So it's, um, it's kind of fun and get asked to, to speak for an hour and, and certainly I'll highlight the, the more creative aspects of, of the brand management function. Um, I would say that a, a brand manager's role is, is the combination of those two things. I mean, definitely has to have a strong business acumen and, and the number side and then the creative side is, is probably the more fun, the more sexy. Um, but. Uh, but um, it's a good combination of the two. I mean, you, if, if one is coming into a marketing, a brand management role, thinking that their job every day is going to be making commercials and designing websites, then they're probably, 
they probably need to be at a creative agency because that's typically what we do is we work with an outside house uh, to put these together. I mean, our job is to come up with the insights and think about the, the positioning and how it's different than our competitors. And then we turn it over to the agency and work with them. And they've got amazing brains that can come up with cats on shrooms and love stories and all that kind of stuff. I think we have time for one last question, if there is one. Otherwise, we'll, we'll close. OK. Thank you so much uh, today. Before everyone leaves, um, I'd like to thank a couple of folks. Number one, the Academic Support Center for the video today. Um, also our photographer, thanks so much. And the Advancement Office for all the work they do in helping us organize this. Also, finally, Matt, we have a little uh, going away gift for you. Um, I know you're a big uh, Tiger fan, and so, um, and you're a season ticket holder. You can maybe use this. So. That's great. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks again for being here. Thank you.